Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, as you can see, I am not Kate uh, Bradley uh, now. She has gotten married. Uh, we want to be uh, in prayer for Kate. Um, she has uh, become in contact uh, with the coronavirus. Um, uh, she's been tested, and we're just kind of waiting for those. Uh, but as a member of our staff and leadership, we decided, you know what, it's probably best if she stayed home today. Um, so y'all be in prayer for her, be in prayer for her new husband, the things that are in front of her uh, today. Uh, this morning we have a prayer quilt that's before us, and this is for uh, Jenna Chapman. And if you know Jenna, she's been uh, kind of in and out uh, of the hospital dealing with some pain issues right now. So we just want to pause and pray for her together as a church family. Um, so if you would, let's bow. And Heavenly Father, I just pray for Jenna. I ask that you would be a, a presence of healing upon her, that you would keep her safe during these days, that you would give her peace of mind and peace of heart. Father, for the doctors and nurses that are working, for a family that's concerned, would you uh, be uh, just very real to them at this time, that, that they would use your wisdom to respond, that they would use your guidance to maneuver the days ahead of them. Father, we trust you with her good care and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's pull them out together. Uh, of course, uh, we're looking at the, the, the life of Elisha. Uh, and we've been comparing him with Elijah, and I know that with my South Georgia accent, they kind of sound, kind of sound the same, don't they? Um, but today we're going to be only talking about Elisha, okay? Uh, so you don't have to worry about it. If you think I'm saying Elijah, I'm not. I'm saying Elisha because we're only talking about Elisha today. Oh, wow. Uh, and we're talking about ridiculous faith. Uh, and so what, what is ridiculous faith? Okay? Uh, ridiculous faith because I believe that there is this really ordinary type of faith that's out there right now. And it's become very comfortable for us to live in that ordinary faith. But I believe that Christ, that God himself, calls us to be a people of faith, ridiculous faith. And the things that I read about and see in his holy word and things I hope about, like miraculous healings, like waters dividing, where is that kind of faith today? And I could only come up with one simple conclusion because I'm, 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 with my heart is that faith must be, ridiculous faith must be in every situation. Whether I need waters parted or whether I need a healing to occur or whether I'm, uh, I'm living in a current a season of victory. Is that I lean heavy on God, heavy on my relationship with Jesus Christ at all times and in all circumstances. That means that no matter what I face, I trust Him to do anything. That means that no matter what I do in life, I can trust God. Ridiculous faith that causes waters to part means that we really trust in God. So 2 Kings is where we're going to be. I'm going to be, uh, start reading chapter 4 in just a moment. Um, so let me set today up for you with a little story. Uh, in 2 Kings, um, we're going to hear about Elisha, but let me tell you another story. There's a king who has this well outside of his castle, and he wants the well emptied. And so he gets two of his most trustworthy servants to go to the well, and inside the well he wants him, them to use a basket, a basket, a woven basket, to dip all the water out of the well and put it uh, someplace else. Okay, So the two uh, servants go and they start dipping the water out of the well in a basket. So how successful do you think they are dipping the water out of the well in a basket? Can you just imagine all the water that keeps coming out, and they're trying to go as fast as they can to get the water to the top and throw it out real quick before it goes all the way back down. And one of the servants looks at the other servants and says, You know what? This is ridiculous. We're not getting anywhere. The water we just keep dumping out is going through and we're not really getting anything. Why should we keep doing this over and over and over again? And the other servant says, well, it's the king's will, and he asked us to do this. So he said, no, this is ridiculous, and I'm not doing this anymore. He threw his basket down and went home. The other servant just kept diligently day after day, day after day, until finally he got to the bottom of the well and started seeing these little shiny objects reflecting now that the water had gone. And behold, at the bottom of the water well, diamonds had been found. Now, the second servant didn't know when he got frustrated and left 
that his labor would reveal such a valuable jewel. But the king knew. Now the other servant who stayed and worked didn't know was at the bottom of the well, but he trusted the king to stay about his task. Look, there are a lot of things that we're asked to do that seem really, 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 really ridiculous. You know, uh, you know, there's a lot of things in our faith that we're, seeing, we're asked to do that they're hard, they're laborsome. How can I trust God in the middle of my heartache, in the middle of my circumstances? It's like, it's like I'm trying to bail water with a basket and I'm not getting anywhere. But can we trust God? Can we trust God? Because God knows that there's diamonds at the bottom of the well. And and to be truthful, I could be that diamond. And your faith and your labor and your work that you don't see maybe exactly getting the progress that you want right now. But your labor and your work that seems so ridiculous might be so valuable to that diamond at the bottom of the well. And I could be that diamond. Or you could be that diamond. Or one of your children could be that diamond. One of your co-workers could be that diamond. Do you trust the king enough to bail the water? To find the diamond? Because I have a theory, or maybe a great fear, that a lot of us in the world today got tired of bailing water because we didn't see the diamonds when we wanted to. And so somebody's diamond is still at the bottom of the well that needs to be gotten today. And what type of ridiculous faith and trust can we have to say, I'm just going to go and bail water and trust that God's going to help me find that diamond. In 2 Kings chapter 4, we're going to pick up on Elisha's story. And remember, Elisha's picking up that prophet mantle. He's a spokesperson for God. And when Elijah ascended into heaven, man, I remember that Rich Mullins song. And when I leave, I want to go out like Elijah. A chariot of fire. Elisha catches Elijah's his cloak on his way down and, and he gets passed on that prophet, that, that presence of God mantle. And if you remember last week, he's on the other side of the Jordan, but he's not going to stay on the other side of the Jordan. He's going on for something new. And so he, he takes Elijah's cloak, rolls it up, strikes the water, strikes the water and the Jordan parts because sometimes... Sometimes we need to get out there and strike the water. Sometimes we need to be a people that get out there and strike the water and move forward. So Elijah's on the other side. You remember there's the whole Jericho thing. And, and so they're over in Jericho and there's been the stagnant water. And last week they healed the stagnant water. You remember healing the stagnant water? So today, Elisha founds a widow. So Second uh, Kings chapter 4, verse 1. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to to take my two sons as slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me what what do you have in your house. Your servant has nothing, uh, nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. If you're a Bible writer at home, if you're a Bible writer here, if if you've got your gadget, I would circle, I would underline empty jar. Are you an empty jar? Do you know some empty jars around you? Don't ask for just a few. In verse 4, then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars and as each is filled, put it, in, put it on one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons, and they brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her, her, her son, Bring another. But he replied, there, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing, and she went and told the man of God, and he said, Go and sell the oil, pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Wow. Wow. Now, when I think of a widow, okay, this is just, this is just Daniel Isles. It's just me thinking. When I think of a widow, I think of somebody in need. Okay? I think, I think that if, if my mother, my, both of my parents are still alive, but if my father had passed away and I think of my mother by herself, I would want to go and take care of her. 
Okay, I would want to go and supply for my mother. You know, so when I think of a widow, it's just in my mind. I know that many, many widows that are strong, many can do anything. But my heart just goes out and I think, I think I want to serve somebody. So there's this widow and she's crying out but she's got, because she's got a problem. She's got a very serious problem. Uh, historically, most likely, this widow is the, the wife of Obadiah. And if you were to read through 1 Kings, Obadiah was one of the prophets of God. And Obadiah and, and this widow, his wife, hid the prophets of God uh, in a cave while uh, King Ahab, that wicked king, was looking for these prophets to kill. And so she and her husband, they all hid in a cave, and, she, and, and they hid these prophets. So, so they've done something good for God, right? And even though they've done something good for God, she's still in a bad spot. Her husband's now dead. She doesn't have any way to pay her bills, and so the creditors come looking. I just want to give you a few notes here. Number one, number one. Uh, and it's just in my mind, at any season in life, at any season in life, something can come, come up beyond our control and beyond our prediction. Okay? It, 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 it can just come up in any season. But in this season of this lady's life, she had extended herself in such a way that she could not manage those things. That's just, that is such an important point in my mind and heart today. In today's world of temporary things, where we spend and invest a lot in temporary things. Can we just agree on that? Okay? We spend and invest a lot on temporary things and extend ourselves. And what happens when a situation comes up where we can't manage that anymore? And I'm also thinking spiritually as well. What happens when we put our hearts on things that are temporary? We extend our heart, our spirit in that direction, but something happens and that thing can no longer supply for us anymore. Well, then the creditor comes. And this is common practice in this time. I know this sounds scary for us. But the, but the creditor comes, threatens to take the sons to be his bond slaves to pay the debt. I mean, even in American history, that is, that's not something that's unthought of so long ago, where in order even to come to the United States, Somebody might pay for your way to come and you would come and work on their farm. Uh, being a, a, a bond servant to another thing. Of course, there's always the negative connotation that comes around with slavery. But man, I, I, I in, in no way at any time would like for anybody to be in bondage or slavery. But there is something that keeps us all in slavery every single day. We would all say that even in the current climate of our world today, in what's going on in our nation, we don't want anybody mistreated. We want anybody to be a slave. Why don't we feel the same way about the slavery that we have to sin? You see, ultimately, I'm a slave to something I don't want anymore. Sin. I wish that we would have the, the same viewpoint on sin as Jesus does. He died for it. Sin is such an atrocity, such an affront to God that it warrants us separation from Him. And there are people living in that bondage today. And I want to encourage us that there are some people, some, some widows. Maybe you're one of them. That's in bondage to sin. And they need some help. And when I, when I think about this passage and how my heart just really gets tied into it, I want us to understand that there is one consequence for sin, and we all have it. And it tells us, you know, in Romans that for the wages of sin is. For the wages of sin is the creditor comes. He's going to come. It's due. We've broken the will of God, broken His heart, and put His Son on the cross. I wish that we would be broken over that. We, we want to solve the world's problems. I want to solve the world's problems. Here it is. We have a problem with sin. And we're living in bondage to it. And there's only one answer. His name is Jesus Christ. 
And I want you to keep a hold of that thought. So this lady asks Elijah, 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 please, please, Elijah, do something to help me. There's only one problem. Elijah's in the same boat she is. He doesn't have two pennies to rub together to save his life. He's just as broke as she is. But there's one difference. Elijah's treasury is different than her treasury. She's looking to give her life value because she can pay some bills off. But she gave her life value and her husband gave her life value because they were able to acquire some things that they thought for sure that they would pay off one day. But there's a problem with that. Those are temporary things and they don't hold the same value as, as Christ can give us. But Elijah comes from a different treasury. He, he has a different set of supply. And, and he knows something that maybe we should know today. It's not the size of the stuff that we have. It's the one who supplies it. It's not the size of our treasury. It's the one who put the treasure there that really, really matters. You see, let me put it to you this way. We have a treasury in Jesus Christ, in God. And, 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 and He owns the bank that we've got the loan on. Okay? He owns the note. He, he's already paid the money for the treasure that we've got. And we've already got forgiveness for everything, for everything. But not only does He own the note, not only does He own the bank, not only does He back, not only is His word backing our note, He already paid it all off for us. Where is your treasury coming from? From a, a treasury that we have to pay into or from a treasury that Christ has already set up for us? I'm going to go for the one that somebody else already set up for me. See, ridiculous faith, ridiculous faith understands that every situation, it's not the size of our treasury. It's the one who set it up. And, and I want God to set up my treasury. I want Jesus Christ to be my treasury. And, 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 and I know... I know, we, we look at this lady and she says, I need some help. And, and I've already, I'm not done with that point yet either. I've already kind of gotten a little emotional about, about people in need, especially spiritual need. And Elisha has this treasure. And, and he looks at her and says, well, what do you have? What does she have at her house? You say, oh, well, we know the story. Don't answer that question. We know the story. We know what she has at home. But everybody else does it. All she has at home is the air in the, between her cupboards. And none of us would say that she had anything at home of any value. All she had at home was the air between her cupboards. All that she had at home. But don't ever discount. Because he can take anything, anybody, at any time and do anything. You want to do that again? He can take anybody at any time and do anything that he wants to do. Anything. Anything. And you may say, well, well, well I, know, I know he has a great plan for my life, but I don't have anything. I can't say the right words. I, I, you know, I know that God wants me to do something and to share my faith because there's people dying and not going to make it to heaven. I know that, but... But, but, but I limit myself. And it shows how big my faith really is. Do I believe that God can do anything with anyone at any time? Then today's our time. Because He has something He wants us to do. He's calling you. He's calling me. He's calling our church. And today's the day. But do we really believe? That He can change the world, change our town, change our family through us. Ordinary people. Take a look at this video. Matthew.
God can use anyone, anytime, to do anything. And right now, He wants to use you. He wants you to change your world. He doesn't want to just leave you the way that you are. He wants to deal with issues of sin and things that we do to break the heart of God. He wants to deal with that inside of you because maybe you need that. But He also wants to do that for others and use you to reach out, to witness, to be His agent, to save other people. To be that rescuing agent for other people. And so, Elisha. Elisha looks at her and says, what do you have? I've got nothing at home. Except. Don't you love that word? I have nothing at home except. Man, except can change everything. I have nothing at home except what? A jar of oil. A little bit of oil at home. And, and I don't know, you know, when I think of oil at, at my house, I think of the, there's the regular olive oil, the cooking oil, the vegetable oil, the extra virgin olive oil. That's what I think of when I think of oil. And, and we don't use oil at, at our house that much. We do use it sometimes. But, you know, at that time, they used oil a whole lot, and it was a big commodity. I have, I have everything except a little bit of oil. You know, ridiculous faith. If ridiculous faith trusts God with our little bit. And so you may say, hey, Daniel, I hear you saying, I know there's people that need to go to heaven, but, but, but I'm only. Ridiculous faith trusts God with the little. It, it's the little bit. It's the accept. It's the accept I'm willing. Yeah, I don't have a whole lot, but I'm willing. You know, I'm not as smart as I but I'm willing. I'm not as strong, but I'm willing. I'm not as fast, but I'm willing. I'm not as young or I'm not as old, but I'm willing. I'm going to be there, God. And God can take somebody that's available, that's available and do incredible things. God can take somebody that says, hey, I I'm here for you. And you can do incredible things with that. Because ridiculous faith trusts God with the little. And so you remember Elisha tells her to go take, go find some jars. Go around, go around, go to your neighbors. Neighbors. Remember that. Go around to your neighbors. Find some jars. Get as many jars as you can. Come back. Close the door of your house. Take your little bit of oil and start filling those cans. And here's where the miraculous work comes in. Mir miracle. You with me? Not normal. So either when she started filling these jars up from the little bit that she had in her jar, either God just kept multiplying the oil and it never ran empty, or he turned the very air that she was pouring into oil. See, when we start trusting God with a little, we start seeing the miraculous worth of God. When we start trusting God with a little, He can start taking us and start doing things that are beyond us because to be truthful, we really are little compared to what God can do. And I want to put my entire life there because I know the limit of who I am, the limit of what I can do compared to the majesty of Jesus Christ. And I want Him to take all of that so now our jar and oil become a metaphor. All right? So either you can be an empty jar that God needs to fill. And somebody, through His miraculous work, pour it into you. Or you can be the one that pours into other empty jars. But the large question is, who's bringing the empty jars? She gets to the end of the miracle and she's pouring, she's pouring, she keeps going, she keeps going. She looks over at her son and says, hey, I need another one, but there's no more. And it wasn't that the miracle was done, it's that the, she didn't have any more jars. There were still miracle to be had to pour out of her jar, but she had not found. Well, I wonder what her story would be like. I wonder what her story would be like if she had gotten some more jars. You see, I think that there's another unsaid participant in our description today. Is there's the people outside of her home that lent her the jars right now. And they're standing outside of her home thinking, what's she doing in there with all of our jars? All she's got in there is a bunch of air. You know, just, they're laughing at her, they're scoffing at her, they're making fun of her, they're gossiping about her. And still, she's willing to trust God in her home. They get to be byproducts of her story. 
Because now she opens the door and she comes back out. And what do you think she's going to do? Oh, guys, I'm sorry. It didn't work. You can all go home now. No, 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 no. She says, hold on. I've got to, I need some help. I've got to bring your jars back out. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to sell you the oil I just put in there. And you're going to pay me. Let's say 20 bucks a jar. You're going to pay me 20 bucks a jar. I'm just going to keep bringing it out to you. And now who gets the blessing? You think, well, well, all she's selling it. She's getting the money. No, it's not about the money because we're starting to work from a different treasury now, aren't we? And now since we're working from a different treasury, she's blessing other people with the miraculous work of oil. And trust me, I can go to the market and get some oil. Okay, I can go down to the grocery store and get some normal oil. But this is miraculous oil. I think I want some miraculous oil more. And those who get to see it get to start saying, look. God did for her. Look what God did for her. So I just have a simple question. Just a simple one. Are you an empty jar today? Well, while sin is huge, and while we put our faith in temporary things sometimes, and the grace of God is so big, and He promises us in 1 John 1, 9 that if we would confess to Him, if we would give our lives over to Him, we'd give our entire life over to him that he will be faithful and just to forgive us and remove he'll change me he'll cleanse me he'll remove all unrighteousness and maybe today you're the empty jar that you need a little forgiveness poured in a little life poured into that maybe you need that miraculous work poured into you i want to tell you jesus is still in the miracle doing business today and maybe you're the ones that need to be filled but maybe you know somebody that is that empty jar. Maybe you know somebody that is that empty jar that needs to be filled. And, and the only limit to them experiencing that miracle is if you would just go and invite them to come to the miracle. You don't have to do the miracle. That's all in the work of God. But if you would just go and invite them. I know you're an empty jar. I know you are. But there's one that can fill you. See, ridiculous faith understands, understands that every single day I need to be filled. And I want other people to be filled too. I, I'm going to tell you a stark story and it's going and, and to leave an imprint on you. Okay, The stark story is about an evangelist named David Ring. Have you ever heard of an evangelist named David Ring? David Ring, uh, when he was born, had a, a birthing... Um, a catastrophe and, and he was clinically dead as, a, as an infant for 18 minutes developed brain damage and, and cer uh, cerebral palsy doctors told him he would never live to 18 would never, excuse me, would never amount to anything and never get married, never have children never have a future but David trusted in something bigger said to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and said as long as God you will, you will use me my life is yours so he started telling his friends, his neighbors, and everybody he'd come in contact with about who Jesus Christ is. He made it past 18, went to college, got married, had children, beautiful family. Now he has grandchildren. He travels around the world now. He's about 50 plus, 60, or 60 plus years old, uh, telling people about who Jesus Christ is. And one of the sermons that he preaches during, during these evangelistic moments is, is stark, but get ready for it. The other people look at him and say, man, God just took something and did something awesome with you. You know, can God do that with me? You know, I, 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 you know, I, but, I, I can, but. And he looks at them and he says to them, just really honestly, in short phrase, this is my short phrase for him. He says, I, I understand what my problems are and what God did to overcome them. But you look pretty normal. Why won't you let God use you? Why won't we let God use us? I'm, I'm super normal. I'm super average. I can carry on a conversation. I can walk. I, I can do those simple things. Those are not miraculous things. God does not have to do a miracle for me to share a story. Why can't I let God use me? Would you let him use you today? 
But w- will you say today, today's my day, today is it. To today, I'm the empty jar, please fill me, God. Or today, use me to fill other people. To use me to fill other people. Please use me to fill other people. Because there's people around the world today, right now, that have gotten things so confused and so mixed up. And then we're wondering, well, what are we going to do? You know, we can't gather like normal. And, and what are we going to do? We've got to wear masks right now. What are we going to do? There's people dying and not making it to heaven. Are we going to go fill some jars up? Today's the day. Heavenly Father, as I am convicted, so may we all be. Please fill our empty jars. And fill the empty jars of those that are around us. Use us to fill those jars. And I pray this in the most precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Please, please use us to fill jars. Amen.